Good morning, everyone. One of the greatest prayer psalms in the Bible is Psalm 51. And this is a psalm where David is pouring out his heart to God about his sins in his life. We've talked about um, having some time together about prayer. This is a prayer of desperation, a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer where David is just going directly to God without any formality. And it is a series of pleadings, of beggings, where David is the beggar and he asks God to do a series of things. Have mercy. Blot out. Wash me. Cleanse me. See, these are things that David is begging God for. Now, notice that he doesn't start it with any formal petition or formal address of God. He just says, oh God, do this for me, please. Do that for me. And so he just dives right in, in his prayer. He asks for these things based on an understanding of the character of God. He says, blot these things out according to your steadfast love. Blot these things out according to your abundant mercy. It's based on the fact that he believes in the love of God, that he believes in the mercy of God, in the character of God, that he's willing to ask God for these things. When God came down in the cloud in Exodus 34, verse 5 and 6, and stood with Moses and proclaimed his character, he said, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and a Abundant in loving kindness and truth, uh, showing mercy to thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. See, David has that same view of the character of God, but that prayer went on to say also, who will by no means clear the guilty. And there's talking about people who rebel against God and persist in that rebellion. So David is coming to God based on his faith in the character of God asking God to have mercy and blot out and wash me. Notice that David owns his own sin here. He says, my transgressions, I did it, I'm guilty. My iniquity or my lawless deeds, I did it, I'm guilty. My sin. Notice he doesn't sugarcoat it or call it something that it's not. He owns it for what it is and he's honest with God. Uh, about it. And so being honest with God is certainly uh, uh, what we see all through this particular prayer. Going on down here to verse 3, David continues to own his sins. He says, I know my transgressions. See, I know I did it. I know I'm guilty. My sin is ever before me. See, he's not trying to say, I made a mistake, it was a misjudgment, it, there's a reason I did it, God, let me explain. He's not doing any of that. He's simply owning it and being honest with it and being open with it. And here again he says, I've sinned, see, uh, I've done what is evil. He, he's not making any excuses for it and he's owning it and he's making clear that he realizes that he's offended God by doing this, see, against you. I've offended you, God. I've wronged you. I've done what is evil in your sight. See, I've offended God. I'm guilty before God. And it's God that holds people guilty. And he realizes, in spite of his own guilt, that God is justified in his words. See, God always, in his word, says, this is evil. And it's always evil. And God is justified. God is blameless in his judgment. Anything that he would have to do to punish David, David deserves it. David admits that he deserves it. And David's feeling about himself is he's owning that guilt to the point that this hyper, hyperbolic, you might say, hyperbole statement in verse 5 shows how David feels about himself. He feels like he was born in iniquity. He feels like in sin his mother conceived him. He's just so sinful he can't get over how deeply he feels uh, that sinfulness. Um, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 that when we really confront the law of God with honesty that our sin becomes exceedingly sinful. That is, we just really feel the weight of it. 
we feel the guilt of it. And David felt that at this moment because he knew what he'd done and he knew the, the uh, per peril that that action and that persistence in rebellion ha had placed upon him as far as his relationship with God. Now also, David understands enough about God to know that God delights in truth in the inward being. See, when somebody comes to God in prayer, whether it's a prayer of repentance or whatever it is, that somebody needs to be truthful with himself or herself and truthful with God. And um, that truth in the inward part, that wisdom in the secret heart, that uh, understanding and acknowledgement in the inner being of man that I am guilty and I am in need of you, God, and I am helpless before you, and I have no excuses for myself, and all of that, that total owning of our sin and that total honesty before God, that is the spirit or the heart of a person that David knew would be accepted before God. David knew that God would not accept a deceitful spirit or a duplicitous spirit or a, or a manipulative spirit, but God would only accept a truthful, honest spirit. So let me ask you this. Can you be honest with God? Can you be honest with yourself? You know, many of us have a problem being honest with ourselves. And until we can be honest with ourselves, it's difficult to be honest with God. So David continues these beggings. He says, purge me. Wash me. Let me hear. Let the bones rejoice. Hide your face. Blot out. See, and of course, all of these are a string of petitions, just like we have in the beginning where he says, have mercy, blot out, you know, all those. These are repeating those same kinds of ideas. Um, notice here that David continues to um, own his guilt before God. My sins, my iniquities. There's some poetic stuff in here. Up here in verse 7, hyssop was a plant that could be taken and um, used like as a broom or a brush or whatever. And it was used in purification rites when you dip it in the blood and sprinkle on people like in the book of Leviticus or dip it in the water and the blood and splink, sprinkle it on people. And so using that metaphor of uncleanness and cleanness, he says, if you purge me, God, he says, I will be clean. See, he believed if God forgives, that he really would be forgiven. And he said, I will be whiter than snow. David believed that God had the power to expunge his guilt so that he would no longer be guilty and he would be fresh and new in the sight of God. Um, in the book of Isaiah, God said, though your sins be as scarlet, uh, they shall be as wool. Though they be red like crimson they shall be white as snow and so God is able to cleanse us and make us clean many of us have a hard time trusting in the grace of God trusting in the forgiveness of God David believed that if God forgave him that he really would be clean and he really would be free from sin we need to learn how to accept God's grace when we are truly penitent before God and believe in our hearts, as David did, that God honestly makes us clean. David realized that the relationship between a person and God is a spiritual relationship and that it's really the spirit of man or woman that comes before God and honestly seeks reconciliation and forgiveness. So he pleads, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. A clean heart and a right spirit is the same thing. And a little bit later on in the passage, he talks about a willing spirit, 
which is the same thing as these two things up here, a willing spirit. What is your spirit like when you come before God? Is it clean? In other words, is it honest? Is it open? Is it sincere? Or is it deceitful? Is it duplicitous? Is it self-justifying? Is it trying to get out of owning what's happened and to make excuses for it? See, is your plan to do right in the future? Or, you know, are, are you really, do you really have a spirit that's lined up with God? The woman at the well, you know, Jesus told her, God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit. Or you could translate it with their spirit and in truth. So it's the spirit of man, the inner being of man, that has to be honest and open with God in order to be heard by God like we want to be heard. So David begs God to help him have the right attitude. And that attitude is the opposite of a rebellious attitude or a self-excusing attitude. It's a sincere intent to do the will of God to the best of one's ability and to have the right attitude toward God. David begs, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit. Now, in Psalm 139, and I'm not sure the exact verse, uh, David says, Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Whither shall I go from thy presence? If I ascend into the heavens, thou art there. But in that passage, he also makes a parallel between your spirit and your presence. If God is going to be with us, if the presence of God is going to be with us, we cannot be living in rebelliousness. We cannot be living in continued willful sin or the presence of God will leave us. Um, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In Isaiah 63.10, God said through Isaiah, that you grieved my Holy Spirit and I turned against you and became your enemy. See, they grieved your Holy Spirit. You turned against them and became their enemy. So when we grieve God's Holy Spirit by continuous rebelliousness and having a wrong and a dishonest and a rebellious spirit in front of God, God's presence will leave us. He will not be with us. We sing that song, that prayer song, Be With Me, Lord. I cannot live without you, but God will not be with us unless we turn our spirit toward him and try to serve him with a clean, right, willing heart and spirit. So David prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, he knew that during that time of, of rebelliousness that he had been in for so long, he had lost that joy of salvation and he wanted it back and then he said uphold me with a willing spirit he knew that restoring his relationship with God was tantamount to having the right attitude toward God so all of these things are important as we think about you know how do we go before God how do we how do we approach God what kind of a spirit do we need when we come before God the depth of honesty we need when we go before God. And in order to be honest with God, of course, we have to be honest with ourselves. David believes, as he said in the previous verses, that when he comes to God this way, God will cleanse him. God will forgive him. And God will restore to him uh, the joy of salvation. And based on that belief, he says, then, see, then means when I'm cleansed, when I'm restored, when I, when I have the joy of salvation, then I'm going to act differently. What's he going to do? He says, I will teach transgressors your way. See, and he'll say, don't make the same mistakes I did. Don't do what I did. Um, God will love us and bless us if we do this. And David will help sinners return to God because he will share his experience as he does in this psalm. He'll say, look, 
I was miserable. I rebelled against God. I wrecked my life. I wrecked other people's lives. I caused so much damage. And God forgave me. And I want you to have the joy that I have now in a relationship with God. So, Lord, when you restore me, then I'm going to not only try to live for you, but I'm going to help other people see that the right thing to do is to live for you. You know, when we're rebellious and we're living in sin, we cause other people to stumble. And remember Jesus said, Woe to you that cause one of these little ones that believe on me to stumble. So we not only sin by rebelling against God ourselves, but we cause other people to sin, and that's bad. On the other side, when we're really trying to do the will of God sincerely, and our spirit is right, we try to turn other people toward God. This just is a matter of what happens when we have uh, the right spirit uh, within our own hearts. So this also comes out in this beautiful psalm. Then David continues his pleas with God. He says in verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Remember he had Uriah the Hittite killed. And of course David had killed many people in battle and in other things before. But this was premeditated murder. And he said, So deliver me. Uh, from blood guiltiness, oh God. He felt that guilt. He knew that he was guilty. Now, let's be clear that whether he felt it or not at certain times did not make him less guilty. Guilt is something that is only real. It only actually exists in spiritual realm in the mind of God. God holds us guilty or not, depending on whether we have met his requirements and whether we have accepted his grace in the way that he tells us to accept it. But only God can hold us guilty. Only God can deliver us from guilt. And so he asked God for uh, deliverance. And then, uh, like he says in the previous verse, then I will teach transgressors your way. You can infer that then here in this verse. And he says, then uh, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. See, when you deliver me from this and forgive me from this, I'll not only teach transgressors, you know, your ways and bring sinners back to you, that I will praise you because of your righteousness and goodness and the things that uh, you have done for me. And then he says, Lord, open my lips. And of course, the way God does this is by God's grace and God's forgiveness. And then he says, my mouth will declare your praise. Notice how this phrase here and this phrase up here are parallel. See? And what is the basis of praise? The basis of praise is the good things that God has done for us. You know, as, as Moses and the children of Israel went through the Red Sea and and uh, God delivered them from the Red Sea in Exodus uh, chapter 15. They were so grateful for what God had done for this. They said, sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has he thrown into the sea. It was because of what God had done for them that they, they praised God for his righteous acts. And now David is saying, Lord, when... When you restore me, when you forgive me, when you erase my guilt, when you bring the joy of salvation back to me, I will burst forth in praise. Then David talks for a moment about our worship, and we've talked together before about this, but he says, You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. Now, some people have wrongly inferred from this without reading uh, the rest of this psalm that God really didn't want sacrifices and burnt offerings. Yes, he did. He commanded them. What David means here in the context of this psalm is you don't want just sacrifices. It's not just the offering of the animal. It's not just the outward compliance of bringing a burnt offering that you want. No, he's already said um, previous to this, you know, you desire truth 
in the inward parts. Create in me a clean heart. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Renew a right spirit within me. So it's not just a sacrifice that God wants. He wants sacrifices given with the right heart, with the right spirit. And he goes on to say that in uh, the next uh, couple of lines. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So if you go back up through this psalm and you read truth in the inward parts, um, a clean heart, a right spirit, a willing spirit, see? These are the attitudes, the thought processes, the kind of inner being that God wants uh, when people come to him. A broken spirit, broken about one's sins, owning one's guilt, a broken and contrite heart, a heart that sincerely is sorry and sincerely has changed its attitude. See, that's the thing that we need along with our sacrifice or our praise or our prayer or whatever it is. It's not just the act of singing. See, we can bring, you know, Hebrews 13, 15 says, uh, by him let us offer up a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips which make confession to his name. But we can sing to God, say the words all day long, but without a broken spirit and a contrite heart, uh, it does no good. So as David uh, wraps this thing up, this prayer to God, he says to God, he asks God, now that he's assured of God's forgiveness, he says, do good, please God, to Zion. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. I'm, he's asking God's blessings on God's people other than himself, his, his people, the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah. And notice he goes back right to the sacrifices. Then, say then means once we've gotten our attitudes right, once we've been truly penitent, once we've been truly honest, once we've come to you with broken and contrite hearts, then you will delight in right sacrifices. See, right sacrifices are sacrifices that are offered with a clean heart and a right spirit and a willing spirit and a broken and contrite heart and with truth in the inward parts. Those are the right kind of sacrifices that we offer. The right kind of, in that day, burn offerings and whole burn offerings. The right kind of bulls offered on the altar. It's not just the offering, it's the offering along with the right spirit. So, let's wrap this up. How do you pray to God? Well, David just poured it out here without preamble. How did he pray? It wasn't the words that made a difference. It was the heart of the prayer that made the difference. It was sincerity. It was honesty. It was contrition. It was true repentance. It was honesty about one's guilt. It was casting oneself upon the mercy of God. It was transparency with God. The lack of deception and duplicity with God. And because of those things, God accepted the prayer. And because of those very same things, God will accept our prayer. I hope that this lesson will be a blessing to you. Our God loves us. He is a merciful and kind God. But he wants us to be open and transparent and completely honest with him as we come before him. Hope you have a wonderful week. May the Lord bless you until we meet again. God bless.